Hey lore lovers, my name's Eric with the Lorebrarian's YouTube channel, and today we'll be exploring the story of one of Magic the Gathering's most deceitful, most powerful, and most iconic characters. A being whose life is measured in millennia, and whose machinations span both planes and centuries. A creature that has destroyed countless worlds and corrupted thousands of souls, that has slaughtered and manipulated, lied and consumed, that has bent the very fabric of the multiverse to its will in a quest for unrivaled power. This destructive force has gone by many names through the ages, each striking fear into the hearts of those that hear them. The Forever Serpent, the Second Sun, the God Pharaoh of Amunket and King of Madara. This is the story of Nicol Bolas, Dragon God, Elder Dragon of Dominaria his rise to power thousands of years ago, and his inevitable defeat at the hands of the Gatewatch. He has played an integral role in the greater story of the multiverse, and the events, actions, and tragedies on many planes throughout history have occurred by his hand. Bulos is one of, if not the oldest creature in the multiverse, and his tale spans nearly the entire known timeline. Within, we will learn of his role in the Elder Dragon War, his ascension to Planeswalker, his death and rebirth, and his manipulation of countless planes. But before we begin, if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, or if Magic the Gathering is dear to you, consider subscribing to the channel where lore videos are uploaded frequently. The support is much appreciated. Alright, time to steal our souls and guard our minds as we confront one of the most dangerous beings ever to grace the multiverse. Let's dive in. The Elder Dragon Nicol Bolas, like most of his kind, is a physically domineering creature. With a sinuous body that stands over 60 feet tall and a wingspan twice that, Bolas's most characteristic features are his golden scales covering most of his body and his twinned curved horns above his head, between which sits the spirit gem. His lean body and long slender legs give him an almost serpent-like appearance that during flight leaves him a far cry away from the graceful elegance of other dragons. With enormous size and strength, his physical capabilities are remarkable, but even they pale in comparison to his magical prowess. Nicol Bolas has power over red, blue, and black mana, and over millennia of study, practice, and contemplation, has come to master all three. His corrosive breath and withering magic highlight his skill in black mana, while his often reckless emotion and arrogant rage or hallmark of his red alignment. Nicol is, however, best known for his overwhelming intellect and peerless mastery over all aspects of blue mana. His control magic and mental assaults have been on display countless times in both storylines and cards, but his sheer intelligence is perhaps his most valuable asset. With tens of thousands of years of experience and learning behind him, Bulas is best known for his scheming and pontification. His plans span centuries, and he has failsafes in place for even his failsafes twice over. He is a master at predicting others' behaviors. He foresees and plans for nearly every eventuality in his all-consuming quest for glory. No matter how magnificent and destructive Nicol Bolas's powers are, they are overshadowed and at the whims of his character personality. Nicol's strengths come from his alignment towards blue, black, and red mana but this combination of colors also brings to light his weaknesses and flaws. Chief among them are the Elder Dragon's immeasurable arrogance and self-assuredness. With a thousand lifetimes to gather knowledge and master the ways of the multiverse, Bolas has had millennia to grow his ego. Since even his first flight on Dominaria, he has considered himself peerless, the rightful ruler of all planes he can touch, and the supreme power across the blind eternities. He considers only himself and his benefit in all aspects of life. Nicol Bolas is also prone to succumb to the reckless rage and passion traditionally found in red-aligned creatures. Despite the layers of plans and schemes, the reliance on logic and reason that is at the heart of his blue mana side, Nicol is occasionally at the whims of his anger, his envy, and his vengeance. Forgoing the path of cold calculation, to bring forth vindictive judgment on those that have wronged him. The final characteristic that separates Nicol Bolas is his innate skill 
often referred to as his touch. His capability to corrode, corrupt, and shatter the mind or will of any victim with the slightest mental caress. Embodying the blue and black aspects of his color alignment, Bolas has effectively used his touch throughout his lifetime to utterly defeat even planeswalkers of old. To fully appreciate Nicol's character and gain insight into the Elder Dragon's motives, desires, and personality, we must step back into history nearly 30,000 years to the time of his birth and upbringing. The nascent Dominaria was a young, incomplete plane just taking shape when the primordial force known as the Ur-Dragon swept across its surface. The Ur-Dragon is an avatar that spans the multiverse, residing within and between the very fabric of the blind eternities. It represents the force of all dragon kind across the plains. A force whose wings spread across eternity, whose presence stirs the cosmos, whose claws tear through the ether, and whose eyes penetrate through the wells of the blind eternities to see the deepest truths of the multiverse. It is the progenitor of every dragon that has ever existed, and in roughly negative 25,000 AR, it descended upon Dominaria, hungry to populate the early plane with its brood. This is where Nicol Bolas' story begins. As the Ur-Dragon beat its wings, its cosmic eggs fell from the heavens and streaked across the sky, like brilliant meteors. Within these eggs were the first dragons to touch the surface of Dominaria, beings that would later be known as the Elder Dragons. These dragons had many traits and abilities that set them apart from others of their kind across the multiverse, chief among them a self-awareness, a consciousness of themselves and their surroundings that was present since their birth. As the elder dragons fell from the sky, they hatched from their eggs knowing their inner beings, and each decided to name themselves their first victory on the primordial and dangerous plane. The first falls and names himself Arcades Sabbath. As he unfurls his wings, the second dragon descends, taking the name Chromium Rule. A third, and largest of them, claims the name Palladia Moors, and she is filled with a deep desire to hunt. As the younglings take in their surroundings, Chromium witnesses two smaller eggs fall from the sky. The last of them to leave the Ur-Dragon's wings was quite an oddity. It was smaller than its counterparts, its shell perhaps thinner and weaker, and from it hatched not one, but two Elder Dragons. The last, the smallest, and the weakest of their kind. These twins shared an egg, and now they would share a name. Rather than claiming two names for themselves the likes of Palladia Moors, they each named another, and taking only one. These twins named each other Ugin and Nickel. In their first moments of life, as their still soft scales dry in the brilliant sun, Ugin and Nickel are witness to atrocity as one of their siblings, Marivia Saul, is attacked by a band of primitive hunters and pack dogs. The twins are stuck where they fell, trapped between rocks and branches. They can do nothing to help their sister until they break free. Their struggle is ultimately futile as Saul is speared once, twice, three times over. She burns several and flays others, but the hunters and dogs are too numerous and in moments, Saul's lifeblood soaks the ground. Nickel is caught in a blind fury, a rage to avenge his sister. How dare these tiny creatures attack a dragon? But his rash reactions are countered by Ugin's calm reason. They are still young and small. They cannot hope to defeat the hunters alone, and so they take flights and leave their sister. This shocking attack molds Nickel's future thoughts and actions, planting a seed within his mind of supremacy, of hatred, and of vengeance. He differs drastically from his brother Ugin, who seeks to learn to understand and to question the deepest truths of their new world. Nickel looks to the sky and sees the sun, a brilliant ball of golden light that shines brighter than all else and has no equal. For the rest of his days, Nickel will liken himself to a second sun, his golden scales marking his greatness. For the next few thousand years, the twins Ugin and Nickel travel across the vast lands of Dominaria crossing paths with many of their siblings and cousins, always being ridiculed for their lack of two names and their small stature. Anger and envy festered within Nickel, 
as he tried desperately to prove to the other dragons that he was great. The still young twins grew inseparable on their journeys, learning to hunt in tandem and discovering ways to complement each other, covering their innate weaknesses. Eventually, Ugin and Nickel came across a strange sight, a human settlement organized and peaceful, ruled by a dragon. Their eldest sibling, Arcady Sabbath, has instated himself as ruler of a kingdom. At this point in time, Nickel assumes the name Nickel Bolas to assert his position as an elder. But more than Ugin and Nickel's titles diverged in the years spent as Arcady's guests. While Ugin sought enlightenment and truth, Nickel observed the humans, learning about their squabbles and weaknesses, in hopes of using that knowledge to avenge his sister. Ugin retreated to quiet meditation on the outskirts of the city, learning about other worlds called planes and their vast connectedness through the multiverse from an insightful old woman named Tae Ju Ki. Bulas, meanwhile, plants himself firmly within the society of humans, slowly gathering knowledge and developing his own skills in manipulation. Nickel's innate ability to touch and shatter minds manifests at this time, when without reason, a villager stabs his own brother to death. The man can't remember what or why he had done it, but his bloody hands clutch the murderous blade. He's been manipulated by Bolas himself. Time is hard to determine from an elder dragon's perspective, but decades or centuries later, Nickel believes his strength and mental prowess enough to finally avenge Marivia Saul, and so the twins make their way to their birth mountain, only to find that the dragon hunter tribes have grown in both population and skill. They've crafted weapons and magic capable of harming the elders and have slain countless lesser dragons. They are a formidable force for Ugin and Nickel, but Bolas has developed a plan. He uses his touch and mind magic to sow seeds of doubt, resentment, and envy within the leaders of the tribes. To Ugin's dismay, the humans turn on another, all along being pulled by the invisible strings of Bolas. In this dragon killer's war, we begin to see the extent of Bolas's intellect as he deftly manipulates the tribes, not only in destroying each other, but into passively submitting to their new exalted ruler, Nicol Bolas. His revenge is finally fulfilled, but this is just the beginning. Bulas has tasted domination, has achieved victory, and has finally felt like more than the least elder dragon. The rest of Dominaria is on the horizon waiting for him. Ugin can't believe what his brother has become, that he has only a care for power and ambition. Wanting an ally to stand by his side, Bulas attempts to use his touch to persuade his brother into joining his cause. But with a birth and a soul shared between them, Ugin is resistant to the mind magic. In this moment, he realizes that his sibling never actually cared for him. Ugin was merely a pawn for Bolas to use to achieve his own machinations. The pain of betrayal, the stinging stab of deceit and manipulation, proves too much for Ugin to bear. The emotional shock unlocks something buried deep within him. A spark ignites, and Ugin blinks out of existence, becoming perhaps the first planeswalker. While his brother, whom is thought dead, travels the multiverse, Nicol Bolas prepares for war on Dominaria. He assumes the title of second son within his kingdom, and uses his human pawns to expand its borders. Bolas himself has also grown in power, gaining physical strength and magical skills. His resentment of being inferior to his elder dragon siblings and his ambition spur Nickel to action that shakes the foundations of the young plane. After an attack on his territory by broodlings of the marauding Vevictus Osmati, Bolas learns that his touch works on beings far more powerful than mere humanoids. He uses it first to manipulate Osmati and his clan, then his other siblings and cousins distributed across Dominaria. For even a dragon is prone to the thoughts of greed, hunger, and ambition. These seeds are fertilized and cultivated by the beguiling whispers of Bolas, until the entire plain devolves into a state of catastrophic bloodshed in negative 20,000 AR, known to history as the Elder Dragon War. For 4,000 to 5,000 years, the war rages as dragons and their human civilizations fight tooth and claw 
sword and shield, in a blind frenzy spurred by Nicol Bolas. Through cunning machinations and deft tactics, Bolas' kingdom conquers cities, burns fields, and obliterates all opposition until he can claim personal dominion over more than half of all Dominaria. During the conflict, Bolas' twin travels to Tarkir, a plane that he feels deeply connected to, one that touches his very soul. And so he begins forming the desolate landscape into a beautiful plane of growth and wonder. His fate and that of Tarkir's will become inextricably linked in the millennia that follow. Ugin's quest for knowledge and enlightenment bring him to many planes across the multiverse, but he develops a preference for a primordial and malleable realm known as the Meditation Plane. He often comes to this tranquil place that merges seamlessly with the blind eternities to contemplate the truths of the multiverse for decades at a time. After thousands of years as a sojourner, Ugin feels for his brother, misses his presence, and wonders of his fate. And so, in the final stages of the Elder Dragon War, Ugin returns to Dominaria and witnesses the horror his brother has wrought. Nicol Bolas and his camped armies take to the field against the overwhelmed and defeated forces of Arcady Sabbath, one of the last great leaders to oppose the Second Sun. But as they prepare for final victory, Ugin's sudden appearance distracts and confuses Nicol. After all, his brother has been dead for thousands of years. Bolas is pleased to learn his twin is indeed alive and wishes to share his glories and triumphs with Ugin. An arrogant Nicol surveys his dominions with Ugin, but the planeswalker sees his brother's trophies for what they really are. Petty baubles that have cost the lives and lands of thousands. They argue over what it means to rule, to be supreme, and in their battle of words, Ugin reveals his ability to planeswalk, reveals the existence of other worlds, and ridicules Bolas for believing his actions have any significance. Nichols' resentment grows. How could his brother be greater than himself? He demands Ugin teaches him to planeswalk, but his sibling cannot teach what must come natural. Before vanishing once more, Ugin warns his brother of the dangers of self-indulgence and greed. Ugin's words anger Bolas, and his planeswalking creates a burning resentment within the Elder Dragon, an envy that cannot be contained, a hatred that glows white hot, a need to expand his power, to grow stronger than his brother. A spark ignites within Bolas as he too, in roughly negative 17,000 AR, ascends to Planeswalker. No longer confined to the finite space of Dominaria, Bolas sees infinite possibility unfold before him in the dazzling drift of endless planes through the blind eternities. His deeds on his homeworld were, as Ugin said, insignificant in comparison to the grander multiverse. But what once resided outside his reach is now within grasp, and Bolas sees an opportunity to expand his power and knowledge, to explore manipulate, and rule all of the planes much as he did on Dominaria. After all, is it not his right as the supreme being of the multiverse? Over the next few centuries, Bolas and Ugin flit a contrasting dance across the planes. Where Ugin seeks truth, life, and understanding, Bolas seeks personal clout, recognition, and distinguishment. The tales of a winged beast, a god likened to the sun, who brings catastrophe, death, and destruction percolate through the fables and stories of many civilizations as Bolas whispers to the minds of weaker beings, and they willfully dance to his tomb. Many years pass as the twins expand their knowledge, and Bolas's resentment towards Ugin grows. If he is in truth the most supreme being, how can another like him be let to exist in the multiverse? Nicol traces his brother's path until he comes across Ugin in the malleable meditation realm. Bolas catches his twin by surprise and immediately engages him in a bloody, brutal fight of magic, fire, and claw. Their confrontation is described as a wild, pummeling path through the plains. They struggle for days, years, generations. Ugin knows only defense and so tries to escape from his brother by hiding in various worlds. But Nichols' rage and hatred are too strong and his persistence wears on Ugin. The Elder Dragon knows he cannot win, but recalls a lesson given by his old friend, Tei Ki. 
my essence will continue to exist in other forms. All things end. Sometimes, that is not the same as dying. Ugin stops his flight on the meditation round and awaits his fate. His brother doesn't hesitate. Bolas unleashes a torrent of fire and death that consumes Ugin, killing him. Ugin's body plunges into the crystal clear waters of the meditation realm, and Nicol Bolas roars in victory. He is truly the most powerful being in the multiverse now. Nearby, a peculiar stone takes shape near his brother's body, a gem that Bolas takes as a trophy of his achievement and places it between his horns. Little does he know that this spirit gem carries a shard of Ugin's essence and will play a vital role in the future. Bolas's victory is short-lived, as Ugin's crash sends massive waves of water spreading across the meditation realm. The tumult rocks Bolas and sends him crashing through the realm, through the blind eternities, until he falls on a continent familiar to him, the island of Madara on Dominaria. Back on the meditation realm, Ugin's body is no more, but his essence remains, and slowly, ever so slowly, the waters calm and gather once more in the lake where he fell. Nicol Bolas's first test as a planeswalker comes shortly after his fall on Madara, when a demonic leviathan planeswalker encroaches on his home plane of Dominaria. Not much is known of the creature, but their planeswalker duel lasts a month. The mystical salvos of these extremely powerful creatures reduces the great continent of Madara to a third of its size. Though the Leviathan is great, Bolas emerges victorious when he uses his touch to destroy it. For a year, Bolas feasts on the carcass, absorbing its energy to grow his own significant might. All that remains of the creature are its massive husks, and along with the spirit gem obtained from Ugin, they are considered trophies of Nicol Bolas's greatest achievement. These husks are later referred to as the Talon Gates and first make their appearance in the Plane Chase set. The Talon Gates appear again in the background on the art of Nicol Bolas the Arisen. Besides increasing the Elder Dragon's strength, their battle has the unforeseen consequence of creating the first temporal rift on Dominaria a fact that ultimately leads to the time spiral crisis and mending thousands of years in the future. For now though, Bolas is content to bask in his glory. He doesn't remain on Dominaria for long. He's already subjugated at once, so he goes on to sow discord and unleash wanton destruction on the multiverse, seeking knowledge and obliterating entire planes, often for no other reason than that he can. While Bolas learns the secrets of the multiverse and accrues vaster stores of power, a strange happening unfolds on the meditation plane in the crystal clear lake where Ugin's body fell. The dispersed waters have gathered once more and the lake fills. As it takes on its mirror-like sheen, the image of a dragon appears beneath the surface in the likeness of Ugin. The process takes years, centuries, millennia, but as the dragon forms, it takes a deep inhalation the water glistens and pops over the dragon's body, coating its scales completely and giving it form. Ugin's essence emerges from the lake and takes a fresh breath. Not physical, not metaphysical, but something in between. The elder dragon Ugin is reborn as Ugin the spirit dragon. He knows not how long it took to waken, but while he recovered, Bolas has most assuredly caused death and destruction. Ugin leaves the meditation plane to find his sibling. There's a large window in Magic's timeline where word of the twin Elder Dragon Planeswalkers is not heard. This is due in part to the events that occur on Dominaria while they're traveling the multiverse. The brothers' war between Urza and Mishra ends with the detonation of the Golgothian Silex in 63 AR. A consequence is the formation of the Shard of Twelve Worlds, an interplanar aura that traps 12 planes within and prevents interplanar travel into or out of it. For nearly 3,000 years, Nicol Bolas is trapped outside his home plane. But that isn't so long a time for a creature that has now lived for 25,000 years. During this time, 
Nicol Bolas moves from plane to plane, extracting what information and power he can, setting up civilizations to worship and obey him, and destroying those who resist. It's during these journeys that Bulas learns of another creature like him, one that opposes his chaos and manipulation with order and structure. The Sphinx Planeswalker and Perun of Ravnica, Azor the Lawbringer. Although never coming in direct conflict, Azor and Bolas fight for control over many planes, and the Sphinx felt the corrupting power of the Elder Dragon as civilization after civilization fell to the depredations of Bolas. Sometime later, Ugin approaches Azor on an unnamed plane, extending an offer of cooperation as he seeks allies to confront his murderous brother. Azor needs little persuading. He refers to Bolas as the Destroyer, a plague on the multiverse, and the two planeswalkers contemplate how best to defeat such a powerful foe. They can't possibly hope to kill Bolas, and even if they succeed, he likely has plans to protect himself. But perhaps they can imprison him trap him on a world and prevent him from planeswalking, rendering his might useless. In 3179 AR, the two allies hatch a plan to create and power an artifact capable of trapping planeswalkers, an artifact later referred to as the Immortal Sun. Each has their part. Azor will sacrifice his own planeswalker spark in order to fuel the Immortal Sun. Ugin, meanwhile, will lure his brother to a specified location for them to spring their trap. After all, the spirit dragon is bait Bolas can't hope to resist. He'd want nothing more than ending his brother forever. And no better place than Tarkir, the plane of Ugin's soul and one he would never jeopardize. All the more tantalizing for Bolas, who is nothing if not vindictive. The Sphinx Azor sits marooned on Ixalan awaiting word from Ugin to activate the Immortal Sun and stifle the threat to the multiverse that is Bolas. For days that stretch into years, he waits, but sees nothing of Ugin. Something has gone terribly awry. Nicol Bolas, in his great wisdom and scrutiny, caught wind of a plan that could threaten him. He saw subtle hints and trails left by Azor on the plains the Sphinx subdued that the Elder Dragon later conquered. More importantly, however, he learned of his twin's supposed resurrection. With Ugin free to travel the multiverse, Bolas can expect his opposition at every turn, and Nickel can't tolerate another being whose power is comparable to his own. As Bolas ruminates over his own plans for greater and greater power, he learns that his brother has returned to Tarkir, exposing both himself and the pathetic plane he holds so dearly. A fortuitous twist of fate that Bolas can destroy not just Ugin, but also the thing he loves most. He immediately pounces on the opportunity. But Nicol Bolas hasn't maintained his status by recklessly endangering himself, nor does he believe in mere chance. Bolas planeswalks to Tarkir, prepared to thwart whatever plans his twin has made. In the millennia since Ugin ceded the plane, Tarkir has grown into a world replete with dragons graceful and deadly monstrosities that emerge fully formed from mystical maelstroms propagated by Ugin's essence that tear across the plane's surface. We see these storms in cards like Dragon Tempest and Fearsome Awakening. What's more, these dragons are themselves tied to their progenitor, and Ugin plans on using his advantage to overpower Bolas in the ensuing fight. As the spirit dragon hovers in the sky, a golden ball tears through the fabric of reality. From it emerges the twin horns of the second sun and conqueror of worlds. Nicol Bolas has arrived on Tarkir. At this point in time, Nicol and Ugin have so much potential, so much power within them and at their disposal that merely their presence is enough to pressure the foundations of Tarkir. In wild fury, Bolas launches a deadly onslaught on Ugin, who dodges, diverts, and nullifies as he deftly maneuvers through the sky. The twins lock themselves in an epic duel, a fight unmatched in the multiverse. With the knowledge of thousands of years and the power of pre-mending Elder Dragon Planeswalkers, it's a wonder Tarkir didn't dissolve in the brothers' arcane melee. Flesh is scorched, scales are punctured, and lifeblood seeps from both the contestants. But as the fight progresses, Ugin sees an opportunity to unleash his hidden talent. He lets out a primal roar 
mystically charged to call all the dragons of Tarkir. His brood responds to the telepathic message, and hundreds of Ugin's progeny descend upon the unsuspecting Bolas in a moment of triumph. But it isn't in Bolas's nature to be taken by surprise. Nickel foresaw his battle with Ugin, and sometime earlier traveled to Tarkir. He planted a seed of temptation and deceit in the mind of a particularly powerful human shaman who was capable of mentally dominating wild creatures. Yasova Dragonclaw was leader of the early Timur clan on Tarkir, wanderers that had long been at the mercy of the dangerous dragons patrolling the planet's skies. Bolas approached Yasova and granted her a vision of Tarkir's future, where dragons would no longer threaten her people, where the only thing left of them would be their bones and the clans could rise up. This vision would only come true if she obeyed Bolas and aided him at the right time. The elder dragon leveraged Yusova's desires against her, and she joined his cause. So, as Ugin's dragons charged in on Bolas, Yusova unleashed a powerful command spell that instantly gripped the minds of Ugin's progeny. It was simple, direct, and unrelenting. Kill Ugin. A moment later, the dragons of Tarkir turn on their creator, and instead of thrashing Bolas, they bite, burn, gnash and tear at the spirit dragon. It weakens Ugin and breaks his concentration long enough for Bolas to fly high in the sky, then deliver a crushing and final death blow. With a horrid thud, Ugin's body plummets to the earth, creating a massive chasm. The year is roughly 3280 AR. Ugin the spirit dragon is dead once more. His heart and that of Tarkir's cease beating. With a triumphant roar, Nikol Bolas leaves Tarkir to its fate, free from his brother's interference, and turns his sights once more to his home of Dominaria, now that the Shard of Twelve Worlds is shattered. At this point in time, Nikol Bolas has gained so much power and has so much potential energy within him that he can't fully materialize on Dominaria without utterly destroying the plane. He's also become metaphysically tied to the temporal rift he created thousands of years prior in his duel with the Leviathan. In order to stabilize himself within Dominaria's reality, he must tether himself to the mana ley lines that course across the plane's surface. It so happens that there is a strong intersection of blue, red, and black ley lines on the island chain of Madara, mere miles from the still standing talon gates and temporal rift he created. Bulas lashes himself to the surges of mana and enters Dominaria, but thousands of years have passed, and tales of his conquests or rule have been forgotten to time. He surveys a landscape where the people have forgotten to whom they owe allegiance and subservience. He's quick to correct their mistake, and a short time after his arrival usurps the title of king and goes on to create the Empire of Madara to further his own ambitions. For nearly 400 years, Bolas rules as God Emperor, often acting through his imperial magistrates and intermediaries while he retreats to his secluded imperial shrine to deliberate on his most pressing matters. From here, due to the time rift and increasingly fragile time stream, Bolas and his closest advisors have direct access to the spiritual meditation plane, and the Elder Dragon quickly transforms it into his own personal meditation realm. While he spends years developing machinations, pondering the truths of the multiverse, and manipulating all he can touch, a threat to his life, and more importantly his power, goes unnoticed and grows within the circle of his highest officials. As God Emperor, Bolas instated positions and titles for greedy and ambitious subjects to prove their worth by governing his empire. Chief among them were the Imperial Assassin Ramses Overdark, the general of the Kensu army, Shishido Mayasi, and the imperial champion, Tetsuo Umezawa. All men are ambitious, but Tetsuo is descendant from the Umezawa clan of Kamagawa and holds honor and duty above all else. He takes the position of champion because he believes he can not only help his people, but protect them from the wrath of the emperor. A strong martial artist, skilled swordsman, and talented spellcaster, Umezawa is a dangerous master of blue, black, and red mana with few equals. 
During his tenure, he spends a great deal of time in the meditation realm, sharpening his skills and learning its secrets. All of this will soon have devastating repercussions for the Elder Dragon. During the rebellion of the Ademi Isles from Bolas' rule, Tetsuo has a change of heart and realizes he can't maintain his honor while he works for a vile creature the likes of Bolas. The champion turns on his master in Ramsey's Overdark, whom he has a blood feud with, attacking the dragon's imperial shrine. Umezawa's skills prove too sharp for Ramsey's Overdark, and he slays the imperial assassin, taunting the god emperor before slipping into the meditation realm. Enraged by the death of his regent and taking Umezawa's actions as a personal affront, Nicol Bolas leaves his physical body on Dominaria while chasing Tetsuo into the meditation realm with his spirit form. This proves a fatal mistake and part of an elaborate trap set forth by Umezawa, for in his haste, Bolas leaves his physical body unprotected. Umezawa casts a devastating meteor hammer spell, which obliterates the imperial shrine and crushes the elder dragon's body. Severed from his physical being, as well as his ties to Dominaria's vast stores of mana to fuel his spells, Nicol Bolas is significantly weakened. For the first time in his life, he no longer has the advantage, no longer has the element of surprise. He's been bested by a mere mortal and human. Tetsuo uses his mastery over the meditation plane's malleable existence to cleave the dragon's spirit. In a dazzling display of skill, faint and tact, Tetsuo Omizawa defeats Bolas, killing the elder dragon who has survived nearly 30,000 years of plots to threaten his power. The multiverse is at last free from the tyrannical reign of its most malevolent planeswalker. But unbeknownst to Umezawa, or any other being for that matter, a shred of Nicol Bolas' essence remains, a shadow trapped between physical and spiritual, tied to the time rift the dragon created millennia ago. For nearly 1,000 years, the Elder Dragon's essence is trapped in the Time Rift, from 3600 AR to about 4500 AR. While Bolas remains in a sort of purgatory, the plane of Dominaria suffers a handful more powerful blows to the time stream, as more Time Rifts emerge and grow across the plane's surface. As the Time Spiral Crisis nears ahead, the Time Rift that Bolas' spirit is tied to expands and allows the Planeswalker to finally manifest on the plane once more. But in a weakened state and without physical body, Bolas is capable only of materializing as a ghostly shade. He assumes the pseudonym of Sensei Ryu and oversees events that transpire on Madara. At this point, the time rifts have become so large that they begin fraying the very fabric of reality and drain Dominaria of its mana. Several planeswalkers have gathered in an attempt to seal the rifts and heal the time stream which is why the chronomancer Teferi of Zalfir and his companions emerge on Mandara. Sensing planeswalker sparks among the travelers and believing that using one could bring him back from the brink, Bulas arranges for Teferi, Venser, and Rada to arrive near the Talon Gates, the nexus of his own personal time rift and the path back to life. Even in such a state, Nicol Bulas has enough power to use and magnify Venser's latent planeswalker spark. He pulls a physical copy of himself from an alternate timeline within the rift and drags it into the present reality, merging it with his own essence. With a roar of vitality, Bolas unfurls his wings and emerges once more in all his splendor. This tale is told to us in the art and saga, The Eldest Reborn. Realizing the threat Bolas poses, Teferi challenges the Elder Dragon to a duel to save the lives of his compatriots. Despite his vast knowledge of blue mana and mastery over time, Bolas's knowledge is vaster and his power greater. We see the depths of the Elder Dragon's skills play out as he easily evades, nullifies, or counteracts every spell the Temporal Archmage throws at him. Bolas then uses his touch to effortlessly shatter the mind of the Planeswalker and rip his body to pieces. As this is a time where planeswalkers have the ability to shapeshift and alter their physical essence, Teferi is not yet killed, but he is dying. 
the mage from Zalfir explains to Bolas their mission, that the time rifts grow more threatening, and if they aren't closed, could destroy the entire multiverse. Bolas surveys the landscape and grudgingly admits that Teferi is right, but he has unfinished business with the line of Tetsuo Umezawa for what his champion did. He vows terrible vengeance on the blood of Umezawa and all that aided him before planeswalking to Kamigawa. The Elder Dragon arrives on the plain of Kami and proceeds to burn down the Honden of Night's Reach and turn the spirit's followers against her. After all, she was responsible for casting Tetsuo's ancestor, Toshiro, out of Kamigawa and on to Dominaria. He cripples the Myojin of Night's Reach before planeswalking once more to Dominaria. Shortly after returning to Madara, Bolas is ambushed and confronted by another planeswalker, but one whose ambitions and desires are far more devious than Teferi's. Leshrac, the Walker of Night, has immense power, but he wants more. He's already absorbed the putrefying abilities of Phage from Jeska, and he's recently received the Mask of Night's Reach from the Myojin, an artifact imbued with terrible potential. But he hopes of killing the Elder Dragon Planeswalker and absorbing his essence to become the most supreme being in the multiverse. Leshrac lashes out at Bolas in an all-out attack to destroy the newly reborn dragon, and surprisingly, he appears to be winning. Their duel takes them across various planes, and on each one the Walker of Night uses Phage's touch to corrode Bolas's body. Limbs, scales, organs slough off of the dragon as he's beaten back at every turn. The duel takes the two planeswalkers back to the Talon Gates, where Leshrac prepares a killing strike. But nothing is as it seems. Out of nowhere, Nicol impales Leshrac with his skeletal tail. He then reveals that he possesses the true Mask of Night's Reach, which he pilfered from the Myojin after defeating her. Bolas had planned for such an attack on his person and prepared accordingly. He then instantly regenerates his deteriorating body, and as shock sweeps over Leshrac, Bolas imprisons the planeswalker within the mask. It's been mere hours since his resurrection, but Bolas has already confronted and soundly defeated two legendary planeswalkers through superior knowledge, guile, and deceit. Bolas turns his attention back to Teferi, who has at this time managed to heal himself and admits his responsibility in causing the time rift at the Talon Gates. The Elder Dragon is no fool and understands the threat posed by allowing the rifts to propagate. He uses the Mask of Night's Reach, sacrificing Leshrac and his Planeswalker Spark, to seal the Talon Gate time rift. With his part complete and no guarantee that the remaining rifts will be closed, Nicol Bolas claims that he's prepared to preserve himself in the eventual collapse of the multiverse before blinking out of existence and traveling to the far-flung plain of Amonkhet. The year is roughly 4500 AR. The ancient Egyptian-inspired plain of Amonkhet is a desolate world with unending sandstorms, brutal heat from the rays of twin suns, and a peculiar curse that fills the dead with life as they are doomed to wander until all that remains are their bones. Bolas's interest in the plane comes from its large reserves of a metallic blue substance called Lazotep and how well it interacts with the magic of necromancy. With the imminent collapse of the multiverse and death of the planes, perhaps Bolas believes he can eternally sustain his life by unlocking the secrets of Lazotep. But Amonkhet is a world already populated with civilization, and unfortunately for its people, they do not know the splendor of the Forever Serpent. Immediately after arriving on the plane, Nicol Bolas uses his pre-mending planeswalker powers to scour Amonkhet and begin anew. He massacres all people older than infants, mentally dominates the gods that reside there to worship him and enact his will, and corrupts the angels of the plane, transforming them into his likeness and instilling subservience within them. In effect, he destroys the history of the plane and rewrites it in his image styling himself as the god pharaoh of Amonkhet and altering the fabric of reality to suit his needs. All aspects of life from this point on are devoted wholly to his worship and his whims. 
Unfortunately for Bolas, an unforeseen and uncounterable force begins on Dominaria and sweeps across the entire multiverse, altering the very nature of the Planeswalker spark. In 4500 AR, the Planeswalker Jessica sacrifices herself to seal the final time rift, which sets off a cascade of events referred to as the Great Mending. As Planeswalker's powers were responsible for destroying the fabric of the multiverse, the Mending ensures such anomalies or paradoxes will never happen again by severing Planeswalkers from their godlike powers, their ability to shape reality and existence at a whim. The Mending shakes the multiverse and rolls over Bolas in an event that is depicted in the art and flavor text of three different cards, each portraying him on Amonkhet during the Mending. First is Apex of Power, where we see Bolas at the height of his pre-mending powers, leveling the plane and shaping it to his will. The flavor text reads, As I desire, so it shall be. Next is the card Frang Omnipotence, that shows the Great Mending destroying his vast reserves of power and abilities. The Great Mending that healed the multiverse also unraveled the threads of Nicol Bolas's power. Finally, the ever-scheming Bolas develops a plan for regaining his lost power in patient rebuilding, where we can see the plane of Amonkhet being rebuilt to suit Bolas's needs. Nicol Bolas would not rest until he was restored to his former glory. A super cool bit of flavor is that all three of these cards mirror the three colors of mana Nicol Bolas is master over. The second son, the god emperor of Madara and god pharaoh of Amonkhet, is now at the weakest he's been in perhaps thousands of years. But he still has his unmatched intellect, his innate touch, and the strength of an elder dragon. The loss of his pre-mending powers is a crushing blow to a creature that has spent millennia accruing them, and who measures all things in their value of potential. And it's his obsession with regaining his vast reserves of energy that will go on to dominate Nicol Bolas's actions for decades to come, as he once more seeks to be the ultimate power in the multiverse. To gain what he desires, Nicol Bolas must plant himself firmly at the intersection of skill, luck, and opportunity. The multiverse is infinitely large, so Bolas sets out in the years following the Great Mendic to make it smaller. He sets plans into motion on countless planes, often isolating himself at the pools of becoming within his meditation realm for years at a time to calculate his myriad machinations. The Elder Dragon infiltrates empires on the rise plunders the minds of the most gifted mages, and manipulates the powerful into servitude, all in the hopes of gathering knowledge or opportunity necessary to recover his lost power. Bolas travels to Ravnica, and disguised as a human creates an interplanar group of spies, thieves, smugglers, and merchants, known as the Infinite Consortium. Though on the surface it's an illicit market for prized or exotic items, Bolas uses a network of mentally dominated servants to spy on many different planes. As he accrues secrets and begins developing a plan, the Elder Dragon is approached by an elderly and severely weakened Liliana Vess, who wishes to regain her pre-mending powers and immortality. Nicol agrees and assists in gathering four of the most powerful demons in the multiverse to sign a contract with Vess, forfeiting her soul for longer life and a fraction of her lost power highlighted in the card Liliana's contract. Unbeknownst to her, should the demons die and the contract default, her soul becomes the possession of Bolas himself, an overlooked fact that will be paramount in the decades to come. Around the year 4540 AR, Nicol Bolas takes particular interest in the plane of Alara, a mana-rich and energetically chaotic world that was splintered into five distinct planar shards thousands of years ago in an event known as the Sundering. The Elder Dragon learns what the shards have long forgotten, that they are pieces of a whole, and that they are on a collision course to merge once more. Bolas sees the conflux of Alara as an opportunity to break through the veil of the Great Mending. A maelstrom of all five colors of mana will form with unimaginable power. If he can seize the power for himself, 
perhaps he can regain his godhood. But merely awaiting the conflux is not enough. Bolas must fuel its growth by sowing discord and reaping war, using the chaotic mana to awaken the obelisks of Alara and grow the maelstrom stronger than it could ever be alone. The dragon planeswalks first to the shard of Grixis, a putrid and decaying world that shares his blue, red, and black color combination. There aren't any civilizations to overthrow, no proud souls to corrupt, only a show of his immense power and a promise to share it with the most ambitious is enough to make Grixis his own. Bolasin states the demon dragon Malfagor as his general to lead armies of Grixis undead against the other shards in the coming conflux. The remaining shards require a little more subtlety to bend to Bolas's will. On the shard of Esper, where artifice and the metallic substance Ethereum are all that matter, Bolas infiltrates and manipulates the Seekers of Karmat to stir mass hysteria over dwindling supplies of Ethereum and spread the hope of finding Karmat on distant lands. The primordial and violent shard of Jund is a place where dragons rule and the only law is that the strong take what they wish. Raka Mar is a human shaman and elementalist with great power and clout among all the tribes of Jun, and she offers her services during life hunts, suicidal hunts for larger and larger game, led by tribal warriors. But Mar has a darker passion, a lust for power, and craving to create more deadly elementals. In essence, a mind easily manipulated by Bolas. The dragon approaches Raka and offers her the power she seeks in exchange for servitude. Fully embracing her role as a pawn, Raka stirs the tribes to pursue life hunts more fervently, filling them with rage and passion that will violently spill over to the other shards during the conflux. Raka may be one of the most effective of Bolas's underlings, seen by how highly he speaks of her in her flavor text. The finest pawns are those with pawns of their own. The Shard of Naya is one full of life and growth, where behemoths are revered and nature is in harmony. The Leonin Nakadal have long since led an advanced culture high in the mountains ruled by the strictures of the coil. Bulas infiltrates the mind of a Leonin named Marisi and plants a seed of betrayal, mistrust, and rebellion. Marisi goes on to create a philosophical schism among the Nakadal that bursts into civil war. The Cloud Empire is destroyed, the coil is broken, and the once advanced civilization reverts to a state of savagery. Finally, on the Shard of Bant, where order reigns supreme and angels award sigils to the heroes of battle, Bolas finds a foothold within the Order of the Skyward Eye. Their ideals of perfection and righteousness are twisted into xenophobic fear and laments of doom as they preach the word of Bolas, unwitting pawns in his plans for the conflux. For years, his devious designs unfold on Alara while he awaits the conflux. It's at this time that the artificer and newly ascended planeswalker Tezzeret arrives from the Shard of Esper. Bulas sees potential as a powerful puppet in the young planeswalker, and so he tempts Tezzeret with power in exchange for subservience. Tezzeret agrees but quickly realizes the danger his master poses. He proceeds to usurp Bolas's position as leader of the Infinite Consortium and hires on Jace Bellerin, a young mind mage and planeswalker, to protect Tezzeret from the mental assaults of Bolas should they cross paths in the future. And that future arrives all too soon in a meeting on an undisclosed plane. Bellerin's mental traps and defenses prove no match for the Elder Dragon, who shatters them with a thought, but the pair escape. Tezzeret and Jace's relationship strains as the pair come to blows after Bellerin is urged by Liliana Vess to confront the Artificer. Vess and Bellerin attack Tezzeret's sanctum, and Jace defeats him in a duel, utterly crushing his mind and his body. These events all unfolded according to the plans of Nicol Bolas, who is revealed to have used Liliana to influence Jace into defeating Tezzeret. A confusingly deep plot with the purpose of retribution against the planeswalker who betrayed him. Bolas takes the mindless heap of Tezzeret to his meditation plane, where he rebuilds and repurposes the artificer to execute his schemes. 
The short arc gives us a sense of how far Nicol Bolas will go for revenge and how deep his machinations are layered. In 4556 AR, roughly 15 years after his initial plans were set into motion, Nicol Bolas returns to Alara and prepares to reap what he has sown. All of his cells, all of his pawns and operatives performed their roles perfectly. The conflux approaches, and each shard is poised to rip each other apart in violent war. The space between shards closes, and the boundaries explode as the plane reforms once more. As shards overlay, hordes of undead pour forth from Grixis. Fierce dragons and life hunters rush from the volcanoes of Jun. Sphinxes and metallic constructs soar from the dull skies of Esper. Behemoths and Leonin tribes surge from the jungles of Naya, and angels lead the nations of Bant marching in thunderous lockstep. Alara is in a state of all-out war, and as the conflict grows, the surge of mana and energy awakens the obelisks of Alara, which in turn fuel the maelstrom, building in the center of the conflux. Hatred, grief, death and destruction sweeps all of Alara up in bloody battle. It is exactly what Nicol Bolas planned for, and the Maelstrom gathers the power he needs. But there's one obstacle in the Elder Dragon's way. A diminutive and recently ascended planeswalker from the Leonin tribes of Naya, named Ajani Goldmane. Ajani's on a quest of vengeance against his brother's murderers, who were working as agents of Bolas. The Leonin also realizes the gravity of the situation, and attempts all he can to prevent the Elder Dragon from absorbing the power of the Maelstrom. He attacks Bolas with blade and claw, fire and spirit. But what is a nascent spark compared to one that has burned for millennia? Nicol Bolas scorches and slashes a Johnny within an inch of his life. Standing triumphant, he reaches out and draws in the Maelstrom. The dragon's body surges with power as rivers of energy flood into him. Bolas's plans have yielded great fruit, and the Planeswalker pulses with pre-mending power once more. The battered and bruised Ajani, left for dead but still commanding unbreakable will, sees an opportunity to strike. A fragment of the Maelstrom's power lingers, and the Leonin uses it to summon the spiritual essence of Bolas's own soul to fight the Elder Dragon. This is highlighted in the art of Ajani's last stand. The two dragons engage one another in perfect symmetry, mirroring each other's strikes. For once, it appears Bolas has met his match in the embodiment of his own persona. The elder dragon and his spirit rear back, then bite down on each other's necks simultaneously. A white hot light blasts from the twinned dragons, and a moment later, Bolas is gone banished from Alara. It's not explicitly stated how much Nicol Bolas was harmed from this fight, or even if it can be considered a defeat, as he presumably retains much of the power drawn from the Maelstrom. Unless the bite from his summon essence released it all, but I don't think that was the case. Support for this theory comes from the tragic origins of the Skaland planeswalker Vivian Reed. Vivian, was a member of the Druidic forest clans known as the Smaragdi, who stood in opposition of the technologically advanced Nura. The Nura were so advanced that they garnered the attention of Nicol Bolas, who plumbed the minds of their archmages for their secrets. After gathering the information he desired, Bolas began destroying the plane entirely, a feat that should be near impossible after the mending, unless Bolas retained the Maelstrom's power. As fires envelop the forests and earthquakes destroy the land, the Smaragdi and Nora combine their knowledge to create a weapon capable of fighting the Elder Dragon, the Arc Bow. Although they were unable to use it, Vivian Reed managed to grab it before planeswalking away from Scala's imminent collapse. After the events on Alara, Nicol Bolas takes special interest in the plains of Mirrodin and Zendikar. Both contain interplanar threats that could be of use to the Elder Dragon. The artificial plane of Mirrodin is fighting a battle for its life against the contagion and corruption of a new Phyrexia on the rise. 
He sends a reprogrammed and mind-shattered Tezzeret, now completely under Bolas's control, to investigate and prevent any one faction from assuming leadership or centralizing the hierarchy of New Phyrexia. Meanwhile, he sends Sarkhan Vol, a dragon shaman from Tarkir whom Bolas met and mentally broke on Alara, to the primordial and chaotic plane of Zendikar, where the interplanar monstrosities known as the Eldrazi remain trapped in stasis. Traces of the elder dragon's long-dead twin, Ugin, can be found in the magical stone hedrons floating throughout the plane. And Nikol Bolas himself visited Zendikar, studying his brother's magic in the Nexus at the Eye of Ugin. Even in death, Ugin resists Bolas, and the Elder Dragon can't penetrate the secrets of the Hedrons, but he ripped the knowledge of the Eldrazi from his brother's mind long ago. He tasks Sarkhan with protecting the Eye of Ugin and ensuring nothing happens to it. While on Zendikar, the Dragon Mage is confronted by the fiery planeswalker Chandra Nalar and Jace Bellerin. Vol attacks Chandra in his delusional state, but is defeated when Nalar unleashes the power of Ugin's ghost fire from an ancient dragon scroll in her possession. Unbeknownst to the trio, the presence of three planeswalker sparks and Ugin's breath is the key needed to unlock the Eye of Ugin and awaken the Eldrazi Titans. This is the eventuality that Nikol Bolas planned for all along. Bolas was responsible for manipulating Chandra's appearance at the Eye. He knew what the Eye held before sending Sarkhan there, and he left clues he knew Bellerin would not ignore, all to unlock the Eldrazi from their prison. Even with the power harnessed from the Alaran Maelstrom, Bolas was not yet free from the Great Mending. He acquired knowledge of an extremely ancient and powerful spell some time ago known as the Elder Spell, which could break him from his shackles, but it required an absurd amount of an extremely rare commodity, Planeswalker Sparks. Bolas manipulated the trio into unlocking the Eldrazi in hopes that their presence would attract countless Planeswalkers to Zendikar. He planned to cast the Elder Spell harvest the sparks of every walker present, then regain his former glory. But his plans didn't come to fruition. Although a smattering of planeswalkers answered Zendikar's pleas, it wasn't sufficient for Bolas's elder spell. It also had the unforeseen consequence of creating a band of allies to oppose him, a group of planeswalkers known as the Gatewatch. The dragon does, however, have another plan in motion across multiple planes, he leaves Zendikar to its doom, and returns once more to the plane rebuilt in his image, the plane of Amonkhet. After the Gatewatch, whose members consist of Gideon Jura, Jace Bellerin, Chandra Nalar, Nissa Ravain, and later Liliana Vess, subdue the released Eldrazi on Zendikar and Innistrad, they turn their attention to Chandra's home plane of Kaladesh an energetic and vibrant plane suffused with mana that fuels the most technologically advanced civilization ever seen. A plane of artifice and invention, Kaladesh is filled with bright minds and burning passions. But dark undercurrents reside below the surface. The Inventor's Fair, a showcasing of the best artifacts the plane has to offer, is infiltrated by Nikol Bolas's agent, Tezzeret. The Planeswalker presides as head judge of the Inventor's Fair, but he's there more than just to judge trinkets. After pontification, his master determined a being on the plane was nearing a breakthrough in interplanar travel, travel that had been severely crippled by the accursed Great Mending. So he sends Tezzeret to identify and retrieve the technology. The being is an elf artificer and visionary named Rashmin, the Eternity's crafter, and she stumbles upon the rediscovery of travel through space and time. This is seen in the art and flavor text of Paradoxical Outcome. Rashmi goes on to craft the planar bridge, but unfortunately her technology can only transport inorganic matter. During the Aether Revolt against the Consulate, Tezzeret locates the planar bridge and merges its artificial components with his own metallic body, incorporating it into his person, seen in the card, one with the machine. The Gatewatch, who have now recruited the Leon and Ajani Goldmain, learn of Tezzeret's plan and cannot allow him to deliver the planar portal technology to his master. 
They attempt to stop him in a battle at the bridge, and Liliana Vest defeats Tezzeret while using the chain veil. She tortures the planeswalker until he reveals his master's location. In pain, Tezzeret tells her that Nicol Bolas is on Amon Ket, the seat of his power. The remaining members of the Gatewatch destroy the planar portal, but Tezzeret manages to escape with the core intact. One more step in Bolas's designs is complete. The Gatewatch deliberate on their next course of action. Ajani, who has fought against the legendary Elder Dragon, warns them of rash decisions, that they should not follow Bolas to Amonkhet. It's a plan of his own creation, where he will have considerable advantage against them and a myriad of traps already in place. He suggests patience in calling upon more Planeswalker allies to defeat the dragon. But time is not on their side, and the Gatewatch know Bolas is planning something that could impact millions of lives. They agree that speed is most important, so they leave the Leonin behind and follow Bolas's trail to the desert plain of Amonkhet. It's been nearly 60 years since Nicol Bolas culled Amonkhet, rewrote its history, and mentally subjugated its gods to his will. Despite this, the Gatewatch are taken aback by how serene, how efficiently the city of Nakhtamun runs behind the protective veil of the Hekma. We can see Bolas's paradise in the flavor text of Open Into Wonder, which reads, The one thing the Gatewatch didn't expect to find on a plane ruled by Nicol Bolas was perfection and that of the card Those Who Serve, which states, The dead perform all work here, farming, building, teaching, even embalming their fellow mummies. The living need do nothing but train. What system could be more perfect? The religion of Amonkhet believes that the afterlife is the ultimate award given by their illustrious god pharaoh to those who are worthy, and to be deemed worthy, one must pass all the trials of the gods, becoming a lethal an efficient killing machine. They are then granted death and taken to the god pharaoh. The accounting of hours states that when the second sun rests between the horns of the god pharaoh, as it is depicted in the art of approach of the second sun, the god pharaoh himself will return to Amonkhet, open the gates to the afterlife, and welcome all to live eternity in paradise. It doesn't take the gatewatch long, to realize that nothing on the surface of this plane is truly as it seems. Bolas's taint has infected Amonkhet to its core. What the Elder Dragon has actually been doing is creating an army of Lazotep plated zombies called Eternals. The trials ensure that only the strongest pass. They are then killed and transformed into Eternals, ruthless killing machines with formidable skill and completely obedient to the God Pharaoh. The Gatewatch has no idea yet what the Eternal's purpose is in the Elder Dragon's plans, but they attempt to stop the madness and make the people of Nakhtamun see reason. They're too late, and within two days of their arrival on the plane, the second sun rests between the great twin horns. The prophesized accounting of hours begins. The God Pharaoh has arrived. While each hour's prophecy is fulfilled in a literal sense, it's not in the way the people of Amonkhet imagined. In the hour of revelation, the gate to the afterlife opens, revealing the vile demon Razaketh, who turns the river to blood and destroys all hope. The three forgotten and corrupted gods reveal themselves in the following hours. The Hour of Glory sees the Scorpion God kill other gods and deem all unworthy of the God Pharaoh's gift. In the Hour of Promise, the Locust God destroys the protective barrier of the Hecma, allowing the desert and its blight to invade the city. And in the Hour of Eternity, the Scorpion God leads legions of undead Eternals, slaying all that remain. The Gatewatch are helpless against the onslaught but they try as best they can to save citizens, to beat back Bolas' zombies, and to protect Amonkhet. But even they are not prepared for the unaccounted hour, the one not mentioned in prophecy, the hour of devastation. Nicol Bolas, the second son and god himself, alights on the sands of Nakhtamun before the Gatewatch. 
Even with their combined might, they're no match for the Elder Dragon that has survived 30,000 years, that has the power of the Maelstrom flowing through him. Bolas's power is absolute, as mentioned in the flavor text of Hour of Devastation. Everything here exists or perishes at my whim, including you, Gatewatch. Each planeswalker attacks Bolas with their own methods, and each is soundly defeated. Gideon's strength cannot compete with the raw power of the dragon, and Nicol Bolas even pierces his shield of invulnerability. Chandra's torrents of fire are simply reflected by Bolas's scales. After all, fire is part of a dragon's essence. Nyssa attempts to form elementals from the surrounding land, but it's been corrupted beyond redemption by the Elder Dragon, and he uses his influence to turn noxious magic back on the elf. Jace goes for a mental attack, and Bulas allows the Blue Mage to enter his thoughts before crushing his mind completely. The blow to Jace's thoughts triggers a failsafe placed by Ugin the Spirit Dragon, who due to Sarkhan Vol's travel back into the timeline, was saved rather than killed by Bolas centuries ago. The failsafe prevents Bolas from learning of his brother's survival and sends Jace planeswalking to Ixalan. Liliana uses her powers of necromancy to send forth zombies, but they are merely ignored by the god pharaoh, who offers to spare Vess's life and train her in use of the powerful chain veil. One by one, the Gatewatch is defeated, and one by one, they flee their failure. With the harvesting of Lazartep and creation of an internal army, Nicol Bolas's decades-long triumph is one crucial step closer to completion. The battered and disgraced Gatewatch retreats to Dominaria to lick its wounds and seek allies in the future conflict against Bolas. Here they gain a member in the Chronomancer Teferi, who has once already confronted and lost to the Elder Dragon but they lose a member in Nyssa Ravain. Meanwhile, an amnesiac Jace Bellerin finds himself marooned on Ixalan, trapped there by the Immortal Sun, the artifact created by Azor long ago in hopes of imprisoning Nicol Bolas. He's picked up by the Gorgon planeswalker Vraska, who is currently acting as an agent of the Elder Dragon. She met with Bolas on his meditation plane and was offered a deal. He would instate her as guild leader of her Golgari Swarm if she traveled to Ixalan and retrieved the Immortal Sun, whose location he most assuredly learned from scouring his twin's mind back on Tarkir. Vraska agrees, planeswalks to Ixalan, rescues Jace, and proceeds to make way to the lost city of Araska, using as her guide Bolas's Thelmatic Compass. As the pair of planeswalkers approach the city, Jace's memories come rushing back, and he realizes Vraska's purpose, what her benefactor is after. They learn of Bolas's plans for the plane of Ravnica, that something very important to him is there, and the two agree that they must keep their meeting and newfound affections towards one another a secret. So Jace wipes the recent memories from Vraska's mind, after which she claims the immortal son. Bolas's artificial agent Tezzeret Planes walks to Ixalan, and with the planar bridge technology, brings the immortal sun to his master. This is seen in the art of Mastermind's acquisition, another piece of a nefarious puzzle. Meanwhile on Dominaria, Gideon and Liliana make their way to the Cabal stronghold, where they confront demon lord Belzenlaw, the last demon to whom Vess owes her soul a contract brokered by Nicol Bolas. Here, Gideon acquires the reforged Blackblade, a sword of legend forged by Dakin Blackblade thousands of years ago, and one that has tasted the blood of an elder dragon. Gideon hopes that it will be strong enough in the coming fight against Bolas. Jura is bested in swordplay by the demon, but Liliana unleashes the full wrath of the Chainveil on Belzenlock fueling it with her rage and hatred. In moments, the demon is no more, and Vess is finally free from indenture. Her triumph is short-lived, for from the darkness bursts a golden flame. The god pharaoh of Amonkhet planeswalks to Dominaria. 
As Nicol Bolas mediated the contract between Liliana and her demons, he put a failsafe in place. Should none of the demons survive, Vess's soul would belong to Bolas. This is highlighted in the art of In Bolas's Clutches, whose flavor text reads, Your contract is in default. You belong to me now. Serve or die. Liliana has no choice. She turns her back on the Gatewatch and joins the ranks of Bolas's agents. She will fill an important role for the dragon in the coming battle. The Gatewatch and their Planeswalker allies can do no more. They all agree that they must converge on the plane of Ravnica and join forces to stop whatever mission the Elder Dragon has planned, which is precisely what Bolas wants. After decades of machinations, Bolas's plan of regaining his godhood is primed. A powder keg is due to explode on Ravnica, and the multiverse will never be the same. The Gatewatch hastily reconvene on the city plain of Ravnica with a ragtag group of new Planeswalker allies to confront the Elder Dragon. But Nicol Bolas has also been recruiting Planeswalkers of his own. He and those working for him have infiltrated and placed themselves at key positions within the hierarchy of half of the guilds that run Ravnica. Through subterfuge, deceit, or promises of power, Bolas gained agents to further his designs in the Planeswalkers Raoul Zarek, Dovin Bon, Vraska, Kaya, Domri Raid, and Liliana Vess. Knowingly or unknowingly, all of these agents helped sow discord and create strife within the guilds and across Ravnica, dividing the plane before Bolas's planned arrival. Vraska and Kaya destabilized the integrity of the guild system by murdering several leaders and creating a power vacuum seen in cards like Kaya's Wrath and Assassin's Trophy. Bon infiltrates the Azorius Senate. Domri and the Gruul clans create chaos and disorder, and Liliana awaits Bolas's command when the time is right. Perhaps the largest piece of the puzzle comes with the Izzet planeswalker Rao Zarek, his guild parent Niv Mizzet, and the experiment Zarek has been working on titled Project Lightning Bug. The Firemind is nearly as old as Bolas himself, and almost as powerful. He long ago discovered the existence of other planes and planeswalkers. He had Rao create Project Lightning Bug as a device that could detect the appearance of such beings on Ravnica. Niv Mizzet realizes a threat to the entire plane is imminent, and orders Rao to turn the project into an interplanar beacon, illustrated in the art of its card. A device used to call planeswalkers from across the blind eternities and draw them in to Ravnica. This technology is so powerful that it requires great concentration of will on a planeswalker's behalf to resist the call. In moments, Ravnica becomes the site for the greatest gathering of planeswalkers in the history of the multiverse, seen in the art of Ignite the Beacon. Unfortunately for Niv Mizzet and all on Ravnica, this is exactly what Bolas has planned all along. The Elder Dragon had a demure thought spy plant a thought in the mind of the Izzet Perrin, the thought of calling as many planeswalkers to Ravnica as possible. With the ignition of the interplanar beacon, the destruction of several guild leaders, and the city on the brink of desolation, the final piece of Bolas's decades-long plan is finally in place. The Elder Dragon alights on the plane of Ravnica and begins the process of achieving godhood. The War of the Spark has begun. With the help of Tezzeret's stolen planar bridge technology, Bolas creates a planar portal connecting Ravnica to the plain of Amonkhet. From his citadel, the Elder Dragon unleashes on the city thousands upon thousands of undead Eternals in his Dreadhorde army. Lazotep, after all, is inorganic matter and has no issue crossing the planar portal. The bridge opens right in the chamber of the Guild Pact, and the Dreadhorde army mobilizes, initiating wholesale slaughter. These events are highlighted in the art and flavor text of Emergence Zone. The planar bridge opened over the chamber of the Guild Pact, reducing the symbol of Ravnica's endurance to rubble. And the sentiment of shock, horror, 
Utter defeat is echoed in the art and flavor text of Ravnica at War, which reads, The heart of Ravnica disappeared before anyone could strike a blow in its defenses. The marching Eternals turn on the city, and they are led from the front by Liliana Vess, who uses her power of necromancy to more efficiently order their movements as the Dreadhorde General. Streets fill with the din of battle and screams of death. Buildings topple, and entire districts are reduced to ash. But the horror is just beginning. The Gatewatch and hundreds of other Planeswalkers from across the multiverse find themselves drawn to Ravnica like moths to a flame. With so many sparks gathered in one place, Nikol Bolas begins the second stage of his plan. With the assistance of Dovin Bon, the immortal sun that Bolas acquired on Ixalan is activated. All of the planeswalkers in the city are now trapped, unable to planeswalk away due to the power of the immortal sun. This is showcased in the card No Escape. And this is exactly when Nikol Bolas' plan is made apparent. The reason he's gathered so many planeswalkers, so many sparks, is that they are required to fuel the spell that will finally grant him the power due. Nikol Bolas casts the Elder Spell, archaic and mysterious sorcery that transforms his Eternals into harvesters and carriers of sparks. We can see this unfold in cards like the Elder Spell and Spark Harvest. After an Eternal kills a Planeswalker and harvests their spark, it flies through the air towards the Elder Dragon, who gathers them as they grant him more and more power. Domri Raid is the first Planeswalker to fall victim to the Elder Spell, but he isn't the last, as the Dreadhorde massacre countless others. With no way of retreating, many of the Planeswalkers join the Gatewatch and turn to attack Bolas and his army of undead. As fighting spreads across the city, Planeswalkers split into teams to disrupt the Elder Dragon's plans. Some protect civilians, others fight off the advancing Dreadhorde, but the most critical task is to deactivate the Immortal Sun and allow Planeswalkers to flee. Each step forward is met with two steps backward, and as the fighting intensifies, Bolas unleashes the gods of Amonkhet, which have themselves been transformed into Eternals to serve their god Pharaoh. The aura around Bolas grows wider, and his power is increasing beyond comprehension. The window to strike is closing fast. Gideon Jura, armed with the reforged black blade, takes to the skies in a desperate attempt to strike Bolas with a blade that has already slain one elder dragon. As he courses through the air, Gideon is knocked from his mount by an arrow shot from God Eternal Oketra. He plummets from the sky as does the hope for Ravnica. But before he lands, he's aided by the demon parent Rakdos, Lord of Riots. The demon takes Gideon Blackblade to Bolas, where he leaps, plunging the sword into the dragon. But once more, Nico Bolas has planned for every eventuality. Centuries ago, the dragon realized the power and threat of the Blackblade, and so enchanted it so that it could never again harm an elder dragon. As Jura strikes, the blade fractures into a dozen pieces, highlighted in the art of Tyrant's Scorn. The opportunity is lost. The window to defeat Bolas is closed. Liliana Vest, contractually obligated to serve the Elder Dragon, marches on Gideon and the other Planeswalkers with her army of Eternals. Gideon falls under the weight of dozens of undead. Bolas stands triumphant in all his glory. He's finally broken past the Great Mending's Veil and regained the power of a Planeswalker of old. But as Liliana surveys the wreckage, as she witnesses the atrocities befall Ravnica and remembers her old oath she made to the Gatewatch, she has a change of heart. Using her necromancy and the power of the Chain Veil, Liliana does the unthinkable and turns the Dreadhorde on Nicol Bolas. This act of betrayal doesn't surprise the Elder Dragon, and he immediately enacts the magic of the contract that controls Liliana's soul. The 
Vess desperately sends the Eternals to strike, but even so, her body frays under the power of Bolas. Just before she is no more, Gideon Jura steps in and using his Hyromancy, transfers the contract to himself, sacrificing his own life to save hers. Seen in the card, Gideon's sacrifice. With Liliana alive, the Eternals are no longer Bolas's to control. She frees the God Eternals from their bonds and they immediately turn on their master. Although Bolas disintegrates Oketra, he's stabbed by a reborn Niv-Mizzet wielding the God Hazaret's spear. This opens an opportunity for God Eternal Bantu to strike. With a massive bite, she rips into the Dragon God, tearing from him all of the sparks he collected, as well as his own. This is seen in the art of D-Spark. In a flash, the machinations of Bolas, the years of planning, manipulating and conquering, all crumble to dust. With grievous wounds and without his power, Bolas is nearing the end, when suddenly, Ugin, his twin whom he thought dead, appears before him. Ugin informs Bolas that he's always had eyes on his brother. He reveals that he used the spirit gem between Bolas's horns to spy on his brother, since it's a part of his own being. And he planned Nicol Bolas's defeat with Sarkhan Val and Niv Mizzet. Fearing that Bolas had predicted his own death, but not his imprisonment, Ugin doesn't allow Nickel to be killed. Instead, he sweeps his beleaguered brother into his wings and planeswalks to the meditation plane, while Jace Bellerin creates an illusion of Bolas disintegrating. Months after the War of the Spark, Nickel awakens on the meditation plane to find that his titles, his power, his scales, and even his name have all been stripped from him. Ugin has prevented his brother from ever being summoned again, and from ever using his power to sow discord on the multiverse. Ugin merges his essence with that of the meditation plane, cutting it off from the rest of the multiverse to prevent any being from planeswalking to it. It's here that Bolas is to remain, living out the rest of his natural days in solitude, to relive the blow to his ego over and over again. This is highlighted in the art and flavor text of Prison Realm, which reads, After millennia to craft victory, Bolas has eternity to contemplate defeat. Nicol Bolas, the Forever Serpent, survivor of the Elder Dragon War, second son and god pharaoh, has lost his power and his immortality. His plane-shattering capabilities and world-bending machinations will never again wreak havoc on the multiverse. So desperate to regain his godhood, and now he has nothing. So focused on one goal and it has eluded him. Nicol Bolas spent his entire 30,000 years seeking power, and he is now left with none. The War of the Spark is over, and Bolas sits in anguish and defeat. But is this really the end of the Elder Dragon? a creature that has outlived and outwitted nearly everything in existence. None can say for certain, but perhaps Bolas is regaining some of his lost strength. We may see a glimpse of this in the card Archon of Cruelty from Modern Horizons 2. Its name and ability is an homage to Cruel Ultimatum from the Alara block, a spell that depicts Bolas using his power. Additionally, in the background, we see a landscape much akin to the meditation plane, with two mountains curved in a familiar horned shape, a floating stone in between. This may not be the last of Nicol Bolas, for what is a prison but a place from which to break free? Thanks for watching this video on the rise and ultimate fall of Nicol Bolas one of the most iconic villains and beloved characters of Magic the Gathering. This was a special video for me and I really enjoyed making it. I hope you appreciated it, and if you made it to the end, be sure to give a thumbs up and subscribe for more content. And now I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts on Nicol Bolas and if you like the longer video format, as well as suggestions for future videos in the comments below. Huge shout out to Alex Joaquin for the intro and outro music. References used can be found in the description.
Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.